All right, next up, genetic changes and morphological differences. So when we compare genomes, what changes do we see? And then what does that mean in terms of having different phenotypes? So we've got some uh, basic types of changes in sequence and organization of the genome. So we've got on top our, our kind of wild type sequence here. All right, and now what can happen is we can have a base substitution where one base is switched up for a different one, okay? We can remove a base, which is actually going to change the reading frame of the remainder of the sequence. We can insert a base, or multiple, which is again going to change the reading frame of the sequence, uh, unless if we're in deletions or insertions by multiples of three, okay, you'll get a amino acid residue or multiple added or removed, but you're not going to change the reading frame if those insertions and deletions are multiples of three. And then the last type here is called copy number variation, CNV, where an actual str little stretch of DNA has become repeated. Like there's an error in replication and the same stretch just gets uh, repeated, repeated, repeated over and over. So not only can the sequence of DNA and the chromosomes change, but the actual number of copies of chromosomes can change. Again, polyploidization here. So if we have two N, we have two copies of every chromosome, that's diploid. Uh, say that could get doubled in like a meiosis non-disjunction event and you get a tetraploid individual that has four copies of every chromosome and this can keep going uh, higher and higher um, like wheat and such is actually a hexaploid uh, it has six copies of the chromosomes in it so that can uh, accrue over time okay kind of going back to that copy number variation that variation in the sequence there that block of DNA could just a large chunk, not just like at the base level, but like almost thousands of bases can become duplicated and repeated over time, massively extending the length of the uh, chromosome and giving you lots of different copies of genes to work with and selection to, to play with as well. And that is how we get gene families when you have a very similar gene getting copied over and over and then those slowly change over time and morph into different alleles and things and then you get um, that sort of beginning of that robustness that multiple ways of doing the same thing so that if something happens to gene a2 over here well you have a3 and a4 that have similar functions and can possibly uh, kind of sort of cover for the loss of a2 this uh, so we can see this in amylase uh, people uh, humans have different numbers of copies of amylase in their uh, genome amylase is a uh, enzyme that breaks down starch okay it cleaves the the bonds in the starch and helps you digest them easier so if we look at populations that historically have had high starch diets like rice and potatoes uh, they have accumulated more copies of amylase in their genome on average than uh, populations that had lower starch diets maybe sort of higher protein or fat and uh, so we can see that in humans actually so this, um, the usefulness of that particular enzyme, there was a benefit to accruing more copies of that enzyme if depending on the diet in your region. So once you have those duplication events confer, you've got your um, ancestral gene here that gets duplicated and then it might get duplicated again and you start to see different functions emerging and then continuing on uh, you have differences in function, differences in expression pattern. Uh, pseudogene is sort of a remnant. It's no longer functional, but it's uh, still there, and you can use those to sort of see back um, in molecular time how the ancestral gene might have looked. And so an example of this uh, in humans is myoglobin. Okay, So the um, ancestral gene has been duplicated and copied multiple times. So we still have this the, the sort of original myoglobin gene that is expressed in muscles but at some point there was a duplication and this particular globin is now expressed in blood and so that duplicated again diversion into two families our alpha globins and our beta globins and so there's actually three genes of the alpha globins in chromosome 16 five genes of the beta globin family in chromosome 11 and then we have uh, myoglobin the original ancestrals on chromosome 22 so they're actually duplications and movement between chromosomes of these genes that then uh, duplicated further and have interesting functions 
Here's another example, the FAD2 gene family in coffee. Okay. In Arabidopsis, we've got one copy and it's FAD2. And coffee now has six copies of this particular gene, and uh, one of which is kind of a partial copy, but they're expressed in different um, areas of the plant at different times during development. So you have this transcriptional regulation going on as well. Um, and so the uh, six is the most strongly expressed, but you have these other copies that are only expressed very small in leaves and such. And so it's uh, interesting to see that this whole family is descended from one particular copy, but has uh, moved throughout the genome and um, gained new functionality in different parts of the plant. So sometimes looking at DNA would give us too much information because of the um, wobble bases in the third uh, spot of the codon. And we just want to take a look at the amino acids themselves. So this is the homeo domain from the Hox genes. The Hox gene is really key in determining what body parts, um, what genes get expressed in what body parts at what time during embryo development. Okay, so lab here, this is a fruit fly uh, Hox gene here. And then HOXA1 is the human version of this gene, very highly conserved. And then we have down here Antenopedia, which is a um, fruit fly mutant that actually expresses and grows uh, antennas in various places where antennas shouldn't be. And you'll see that in box 3.2, um, where you get this uh, homeotic transformation where there's a, a body part that gets sort of changed into a different body part because of where this um, uh, Hox gene is being expressed over time. So these, uh, the, the fruit fly and the human uh, normal genes are more closely related than the fruit fly mutant gene down here with the blue bases shown. And so here's an example of that where you get your um, wild type drosophilia, but then when you have the antennapedia mutant, you get um, legs growing where there should be antenna. Okay. And then there's a, another mutant called bithorax where you have an extra pair of wings. Okay, so look at uh, box 3.2 for some more of those examples. And so the major sources of these differences in genome are the small ones, the base substitutions, the insertions, deletions, and then uh, copy number changes and other sequences. And the base change is where we get sort of our little variation between individuals, while they're pretty significant if you look at a different species. And so what we want to do when we compare different species is look at the expansion of the genome, how gene copies changed over time and such, the diversification of gene families. That's how we're going to look at uh, different species as opposed to um, between individuals. So these effects of genomic variation, what the direct um, uh, effect of a change in a DNA sequence is a change and then the amino acid sequence, okay? The changes are protein with uh, differences in the sh protein shape actually affecting its function, okay? We could also get variation in gene regulation. If a promoter sequence is changed, that's going to uh, affect how the, the gene is expressed, where it's expressed, when it's expressed, how much of it, okay? Splicing, like the, we saw before, uh, you can get related proteins, those isoforms, okay, and different functional domains may or not, may not be present depending on what exons were included or not. And then we can get new genes that just sort of pop up and new functions, but that's extremely rare. But when it does happen, it can have a very significant impact. So we're going to look at box 3.3 about origins of novel genes there. And then changes involving RNA encoding genes, because we know that non-coding RNA is emerging more and more as a huge factor in, in gene expression. Uh, so that is going to, changes in those sections will change how other genes are expressed. So depending on uh, whether or not you're looking at individuals of the same species or closely related species or very different species, the, there's different amounts of, of genomic variation that are going to contribute to how different your phenotype is. So when you're looking at individuals of the same species, you're looking at specific changes in amino acids, uh, results of small mutations and such. But when we're looking at closely related species where novel genes and splicing variations become more important. And then if we're looking at really distant species, there's um, uh, maybe regulatory sequences as more prominent of a, of a uh, 
consideration compared to the overall contribution of mutations and such. So an example of how regulation as opposed to um, actually changing coding sequence gets you a phenotypic variation. If you look at, uh, there's this kit ligand in, in northern European populations, so like Dutch, Scandinavian and such. And in the promoter region uh, ahead of this uh, kit ligand gene, you have this particular little sequence here. And with this, this sequence with a adenine residue here, you end up getting a high level of expression of the downstream gene and you get a darker pigmentation of hair. There's a single amino acid switch here that lowers the level of kit ligand expression in this particular Northern European population uh, that produces sort of a blonde hair effect. Now this gene is one of five or six, I believe, that affect uh, human hair color. There are other ones, and uh, especially in other populations and such. This one is not actually tied to blue eyes because there are pigment, hair pigmentation genes that are tied to also eye pigmentation. But within this population, just this change, it's pretty far away, 350,000 kilobases away uh, was enough to change the expression level um, and change hair pigmentation color. So, so sort of in summary, uh, Genomic changes, changes to the DNA will produce phenotypic variation uh, due to ch mainly changes in amino acid sequences or changes in the expression pattern of those proteins and then changes in RNA splicing, how the RNA is, is assembled together when you cut out the uh, introns. Uh, when you're looking at comparing genomes of two different species, you see these novel genes have probably arisen, something that's given a new, new function and therefore um, sort of distance those species apart. And then also genes encoding non-coding RNAs can about allow very rapid changes in gene regulations. It's sort of the forefront of genetics right now is these non-coding RNAs. So um, in this figure down here, we have our genome changes, our substitutions, um, our insertion deletions, which is commonly called indels. They're sort of lumped together. Copy number variations, uh, gene families, employee, all these things affecting the genome will lead to these functional changes, okay? Either in those three, and those, those functional changes will um, become sort of phenotypic change that the natural selection uh, can act upon, okay? And I'll see you in chapter four.